Before we begin, we'd like to say thank you to the supporter of this episode, Ward Hadaway. With more than 450 staff and over 90 partners, Ward Hadaway is one of the UK's top 75 law firms with a reputation for quality, innovation and a partner-led commitment to client service excellence. To find out more about Ward Hadaway and their services, visit www.wardhadaway.com or call the Newcastle office on 0191 204 4000. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Future, a podcast by the Entrepreneurs Forum where we talk to Northeast entrepreneurs about their work, their lives and especially their views on the future and how they're innovating as they plan ahead. I'm Yvonne Bell and today I'm talking to Dr. Arnab Basu, founder of Chromec. Chromec is a worldwide supplier of detection technology focusing on the medical security screening and nuclear markets with an overarching goal to save lives and make people safer. As one of only four companies in the world that manufactures CZT, Chromec creates ZZT-based gamma and X-ray radiation detectors and imaging devices that can not only find cancers and early stage dementia, but can also detect and prevent dirty bombs and nuclear accidents. Good morning, Arnab. Good morning. Now that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot of things that you do there. And I've just got to get to the bottom of this. Can we start by going back a bit, though, going back to when you were younger, you know, quite a lot younger, um, where did your passion for the sector begin? Have you always been scientifically minded? Uh, I wish I could say I was always scientifically minded, you know, but my dad was an engineer. And as I was growing up in India, in in Calcutta, uh, my dad had, uh, during my formative years, really, my dad had just left his job with a British company and was starting his own business in material processing and really in material science. Uh, So that's probably where my interest in in materials and technology originates. But during my students here in in India, uh, both in school and, and then later, in the university. I was more interested in music and drama. And Yeah, I read that you were, you were in school bands and things. What, what kind? <laughs> did you play instruments or did you sing? Uh, I did play instruments. I played guitar and mandolin and uh, I, did, wow. I did try out a bit of singing as well. But, but by my <laughs> real passion was acting as stage acting. So really? Well, that's interesting. Uh-huh. So does that help in your business? I believe so to a certain extent because uh, a large part of what I do is, is really tell the story of Chromec to people, whether it's an investor or a, or a customer or anybody else. Uh, that's, that's part and helps the business. So, you know, when you start off in, in a technology business, you're, you're really what you're doing is selling a vision and taking taking a large group of people together with you. Uh, that includes people who work in the company and form a common goal. And so I think in being able to articulate a story is an important skill for anybody who is starting off. Yeah, but I bet your dad didn't think that, did he? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's probably know. saying, knuckle down, knuckle down. Uh, I- I- exactly, to a certain extent. Uh, I wanted to study English literature and uh, not, not many people that knows it. So back in when I was choosing my equivalent of A-levels, but I was very sternly told my, by my dad that you're doing physics, chemistry and maths. So. Wow. Uh-huh. And I suppose if you had some kind of grounding in it with him having done it himself or him having some influence, um, it would be sort of a, a natural progression. I think so. And I'm glad that my dad, when I was uh, 17, actually told me very sternly what to do because um, I wouldn't change anything for mm-hmm. uh, for what I do today. So uh, for, so that was the right decision. Yeah. So it, it was through your university years that you, you this is where you started to do sciences and um, you obviously you went down a certain route. What was your route? What was your specific um, focus? So, you know, I... I after I graduated in India, which was in, in natural sciences, so my, my first degree was a combined physics, chemistry and maths degree. And, and I went into a family business for, for a few years. And, and all my formative years, as I said, uh, I, you know, I had been looking forward to joining the business. Um, but after being there for a few years, I, I did realize that uh, I wanted to do something different. And not that you know, I didn't like working for my dad, but I just didn't see me being there for, for my rest of my life. So the easiest way of coming out of, of a family business was to become a student again. And that's how I came to uh, the UK. Uh, to do a materials engineering degree in Northumbria. And, and those were really fun years. Uh, I had a really fantastic time in Newcastle in, in uh, Northumbria University. Did a stint with a company in North Tyneside, which was part of the Inventors Group. 
uh, working on uh, detectors and sensors, uh, particularly temperature sensors. And it gave me a, f- a fantastic exposure to the world of, again, material science. That's a really common theme. And that's how I came in touch with uh, Durham University. So when, uh, because that particular company had an R&D activity in Durham University. And when, sadly, that, that company was closing down its major operations in the Northeast and moving everything to China, I had an option to either go to China or to uh, really do something different. And Durham very kindly offered me uh, to do a PhD, a fully funded uh, place to do a PhD. And and me, I'm, I'm not particularly, you know... Uh, <sighs> I wouldn't class myself as completely academic minded, but I, I, I saw that as an opportunity and I grabbed it and, and uh, I, I focused and, on doing my PhD and that's how my interaction with Durham started. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. And it's, it's good that you stayed in the area. You know, there's a, good for us. There, there is a saying that once you are in Durham, you never leave Durham. So, and mm, right now, I could imagine. I could so, imagine. But uh, after I finished my PhD in Durham. I, I had a job lined up as an investment bank, in investment banking, really, in London. Because by, by that time, I said, uh, I, what I really fancy is, is a stint in the city and 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 all the all that uh, glitters in the city. So trappings, oh, exactly, exactly. Uh-huh. And a lot of physics graduates and PhDs actually end up in the city. So and Durham okay. is is one of those universities which does provide a lot of talent into the city. But uh, after I finished my PhD, I went traveling for a few months, uh, really as a break, uh, saying almost goodbye to the Northeast. But I was approached by the university and and the founder of this business, um, you know, I'm the founding CEO. The the company was being formed by Professor Max Robinson in those days in the universities. And they were looking for somebody to lead it and take this forward. So they contacted me. And I came back on the 17th of May in 2003 and the company started on 19th of May. Oh wow. Uh, so, <laughs> that was a quick uh, so, a quick um sort of dive into a into a business, isn't it? Yes, and the first day I still remember it was a it was it was a room in Mountjoy Center in in the university with a second hand computer that I grabbed from somebody I can't remember whom anymore. And what we had was a piece of paper, which was mm-hmm. the first patent that Durham was granted. So that's that was the origin of Chromex. That was the origin of what we called in those days Durham mm-hmm. Scientific Crystals. Okay. Yeah. So tell us what Chromex do now. Then how has it changed much from then? Yes, it has been quite a journey. So what we do today is we we make radiation detectors for three global markets, medical imaging, security screening and nuclear detectors. And and why why what we do and what what we bring to the market is is really the detectors we use provides color imaging capability or very accurate detection capability in the world of x-rays and gamma. We've all seen how the world of photography has completely transformed from black and white film-based photography into something that is completely high pixel density, high resolution, color, and digital photography. Now, that change was driven because we like to see uh, good quality photographs. Uh, photographs which has got a lot of information in it which makes photographs looks like the real thing information rich photographs really makes us uh, feel that we are looking at the real thing and and the technology that that is an enabler is another semiconductor called silicon which is a great detector of light and and what we have the CZT is a great detector of x-rays and gamma rays very similar to what silicon does in the world of photography CZT does in the world of radiography, where X-rays or gamma rays are used for imaging, whether it's for detection of cancer, whether it's for detection of uh, nuclear material, which can be used by terrorists or nuclear power plants, or simply uh, in in places where you're looking for understanding whether a bag contains a bomb or not, or is is a bag safe to go on an aircraft. So we are you know, the industry which uses x-rays and gamma rays is transitioning like the industry of photography from film-based black and white imaging to color, digital, information-rich imaging in the world of radiography. And we have the enabling technology like silicon. We have got CZT in the world of radiography, right. which can make it happen really, uh, you know, faster and is enabling technology in that. So, as you rightly say, we are, we are only a, there's only a few handful of companies which can do this. We are one of them. And the reason why that imaging is important is because if you've got better quality of 
information within your imaging, whether whether you're a radiographer in a hospital or whether you're a, a security personnel in an airport, you can take better decisions because you get more information. And that better decision generally leads to operational efficiency. You can take you know, better decision to make your operations go faster, more efficiently, and ultimately mm-hmm. save cost and have a better outcome. So in the world of you know, healthcare, earlier detection of cancer has a fantastic benefit of having a better patient outcome. But ultimately, the overall cost of care comes down. So both from a personal experience and also the healthcare system point of view, earlier, better, more reliable detection provides real benefits. And that's why we exist. Yeah. And moving on from that one to the early stage dementia. I mean, that if you can do something about that as well, that's, um, that's going to get to a lot of people as everybody lives longer. Indeed, it's, it's, you know, everything that we do in Chromec uh, somehow relates to either making our lives safer or better, the quality of life gets better. So, and, and it's a great motivator for, for us to, to be doing that. You know, on one hand, we are providing detection systems and, and we have detection systems which are going into machines, which are enabling doctors and, and radiographers to catch diseases early, like, like cancer, like osteoporosis, to increasingly getting into dementia-related uh, issues. On the other hand, we are, we are keeping cities and infrastructure safe uh, from the attack of nuclear dirty bombs. So, yeah, what is it? What is a dirty bomb? So dirty bomb is a term used where, in simple terms, when, you know, if a terrorist or people with bad intent is trying to do harm, is really, they conventionally used nails or ball bearings or shrapnels, which we know about in a bomb, which, which harms and, and, and hurts people. Dirty bombs are where you're putting something different, something either nuclear material, which does not harm people in the same way as a shrapnel does or a piece of glass does, but but it harms people in different ways. So so if you put nuclear material in a conventional uh, sort of bomb, it it spreads nuclear radiation and and Mm -hmm. and uh, you can't see it. You you can't can't see see it, but but the effects are devastating. It's very relevant to day to day. Today is the 10th anniversary of the devastating tsunami uh, that happened in, in Japan. Oh, it was. In, in yes, it was. And, and, and we have seen what a nuclear event means to people's lives. Mm-hmm. And a dirty bomb explodes within a city infrastructure will make that that area completely uninhabitable for a period of time and the devastation it can cause is huge so government spends a lot of effort time resources and tries to protect cities infrastructures against such terrorist attacks whether it's dirty mm-hmm. bomb whether it's chemical attacks whether it's biological and accidents i suppose as well and accidents or uh, you know in- intentfully done by terrorists yeah. so uh-huh, yeah gosh that's uh, that's quite something i can't believe it's 10 years actually it doesn't seem that long it- ago does it Indeed, indeed. So um, you've just received some funding for airborne viruses. Now, this is a this is a new thing. And I did see you on television talking about it. Um, Was it late last year? Um, Tell me a little bit about this, because this is this is very current within our heads, isn't it? Very much so. Let, let, Let me take you back a couple of steps on this. We we have a very strong relationship with the U.S. government, particularly with DOD and uh, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. And and in 2016, uh, 2015-16, we were involved in a program with DARPA, uh, which is the world's most well-known innovation agency, which is part of the U.S. Department of Defense, for building uh, a very, you know, building large networks of radiation detectors to track movement of nuclear material uh, to prevent, you know, any illicit movement of nuclear material, which could be related to terrorism um, activity. So this is this was designed to be an early alert system for the nuclear dirty bombs in cities or critical infrastructures. We became the sole supplier in that contract in 2017, 2018, and ultimately supplied over 10,000 detectors to the US government, which now is protecting New York City, which protecting other infrastructures around the world. And that is a technology which is now in full commercial phase of, of deployment and expansion. 
you know, what it does is, is there's a lot of detectors dispersed in a city, people carrying or vehicles having it, and all the data is brought together over mobile phone network to build up almost a heat map of a city. So you can track movements of uh, what you want to track uh, in terms of nuclear material. Now, that was specifically done to protect cities and infrastructures against nuclear dirty bomb. Now, the U.S. government also then, after successfully delivering that program, wanted to add similar capabilities to protect infrastructures and cities against the attack of biological or chemical attacks. So in late 2018, we were awarded a contract by DARPA, again, uh, to develop a airborne pathogen detection system, which would be a world's first in vehicle-mounted sampling air, 24/7, uh, going around this, uh, you know, wherever it wants to go around in a mobile platform, and samples air and gives the full pathogenic content of that air, viruses, bacteria, and everything that may be deemed harmful. So we started that project in 2018 much, much before the whole COVID-19 was known to us. So, and over the last year or so, of course, COVID-19 showed what a biological event, what havoc mm. a biological event can cause to our society, economy, and everything else that goes around. So, so a lot of focus started to come on how to deliver a fast solution to detect COVID from air. Because at the moment, all technologies are aimed at uh, taking a sample, analyzing that sample, whether it's a PCR test, whether it's a, you know, f uh, sort of lateral f flow or whatever. It's very personal based. You have to take a sample, you have to take a swab, analyze that. And this, what we are doing, we are delivering now at the point where we are starting pilots and actual, you know, real life implementation is we are able to sample air and provide absence, presence, and in certain cases, quantitative amount of uh, presence of COVID-19 in air. Critical. If, you, if you're going in a public place, we could have a system sitting there silently measuring, uh, you know, if there is COVID in the air or not. Certain critical operations, places like mass transport, places like uh, certain parts of NHS, this would be a unique capability to bring. But this is just an interim capability we are bringing because the ultimate long term or medium term, I'm saying medium term, which is end of this year, early next year, what we will have is we now all understand uh, sequencing because we hear about the Kent, uh, you know, mutant or the Brazilian mutant or whatever we, you know, various mutants of COVID-19. That is done by gene sequencing, by sequencing the DNA of the virus. So the fundamental technology we are developing under that DARPA program is take air and do a full DNA sequencing of that air to understand every pathogen that is present in the air. Not only COVID, but the whole broad spectrum and novel viruses. So if these systems, if this technology and system was available back in early 2020, and was implemented in places like airports, uh, where people are coming from uh, outside the country or from different regions into a region. We now know that COVID-19 was probably present in air in January 2020. We just were blissfully unaware of it. If such a system was available and was fully implemented in airports in those times, we would have known that there was an unknown virus in the air. Be alerted. And, and 2020 could have been a very different year for all of us. Now, we can't undo history, but if we are able to build a large network of these cap this capability, not only in the UK, but around the globe, we are starting to talk now about a global pandemic alert system. So that's the overall vision of, of what we are doing together with DARPA. You're giving hope. You're giving hope, yeah, because it's it's um, even at this stage we sort of feel well, you know, something else could go wrong and we'll go back on lockdown. It could be perpetual, but you're giving hope, even if it's in a few years to come. You're saying it's by the end of the year or next year. It's still it's still in our lifetimes, isn't it? Very much so, and and you know we are we are going to have COVID nineteen specific systems ready. We, we have, have them in the laboratory now, and it's going to go out in testing in, in the Northeast, in various locations, actually, uh, over the next month or so, starting real real life pilots and, and understanding how the implementation will work. But the gene sequencing, the mobile gene sequencing, which now takes days, 
can be done, you know, what we are doing can be done in situ is important because, you know, COVID-19 pandemics are rare. You know, the last pandemic was back in, you know, 1920s or 1918, 1919. So it's, it's every, you know, it's been 100 years. But viruses which are, which are equally harmful and equally contagious are not that rare. In the last 20 years, we have had SARS, we have had MERS, we have had Ebola, and now we have had COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. We have skirted, you know, the danger has always been there in the world. And if you now, a lot of virologists, now a lot of epidemiologists are, are being very vocal about it, that we got to do something so that we don't have to encounter this again in our lifetime. So we got to have technology we got to have capability which can act as early alert system, which can, again, the same principle as we do in cancer detection, detect early, you can act. It. Good. Yeah, catch exactly. it. I think that I suppose the difference between now and the early 19, well, 1918 was we just didn't have, there weren't the number of people and there weren't the number of people crammed into aeroplanes and, and uh, you know, metro much lines so. yeah. and things like this. So it's it's a change, isn't it? So it's we've had to move on, which is great that you are. Um, it's good that there's somebody out there doing that for us. I really appreciate it. Mm. Um so moving on to your DS3 products. Now, these apparently, and I, I'm just reading this, are used to protect public officials in high profile events. Are there future applications for these products? Are these similar? Look, the D3S is what we developed with DARPA in 2016, 15, 2016. And this is the, these are the products which are protecting New York City against that dirty bomb. Uh, you know, we, we have already... Uh, sold in over 26 countries. This is, of course, you know, a lot of the applications we can't talk about because of the security sensitivity of the. But there are certain certain events that that are publicly known, like whenever the president of the United States mm-hmm. comes to Brussels uh, for NATO summits. These are the things that uh, that the authorities deploy to protect uh, such events and and many many events. You know, including starting from. President Trump's actually inauguration mm-hmm. was, uh, these were the systems that were used uh, to protect the perimeters. And, and so these are widely used. The application of these vary from uh, so, sort of border security to uh, infrastructure security to network detection for uh, tracking of, you know, terrorism activity. So, and we are expanding the uh, use cases. We are expanding our customer base and we expect to see more and more of these getting deployed all around the world. And these are all made in Sedgefield. I love that. I love that they are. Do you have any other factories? Do you not, do you, do you not have anything in the USA then? Yes. Yeah, so we have two manufacturing bases, one in Sedgefield and, and the other in Pittsburgh, just outside Pittsburgh, actually in, in Pennsylvania. And we have two engineering sort of facilities, one in Huddersfield, and one in California. Both the U.S. companies we acquired in 2010 and 2013. Uh, so, but, you know, those are critical facilities for us. And so we employ 50% of our people in the U.K. and roughly 50% yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. In your opinion, what will the face of the industry look like in five or 10 years? Because you're telling me things here without sort of giving trade secrets away that you've got things coming up virtually every, every day that you'll, you'll be moving on with. So it must be hard for you to look ahead and know what's going to happen. Look, I mean, we, are, we live in a world and, and in, in an era, and it's fascinating where, where the world's change is so fast. I mean, I think the rate of change in, in technology, you know, in our lifetime has been phenomenal. I mean, when I came to study engineering in Northumbria, internet was not something you did all the time. Uh, you know, I, I, I still remember doing most of my studies and research in a library with hard books. And if you wanted some information, you, you went and looked at the catalog mm, in, yeah. in the library. Yep. So the world has changed rapidly, you know, in, in the last 20 years. I mean, it's, 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 it's an unrecognizable yeah. changes, social media, you know, digital platforms. And, and I think within our industry as well, uh, the use of, for example, of the use of AI in understanding healthcare outcomes in healthcare, how you do detection. So it's going to be much more uh, digitally driven, uh, as we all know, much more technologically driven. And the capabilities, particularly in healthcare, that we are bringing is very much aligned to that sort of revolution where 
early detection, detection with, you know, automatic detection is going to be more and more of norm in oncology and, and places like that. Similarly, in security industries, you know, the whole concept of being able to map a whole city and provide live information about movement of nuclear material, that was sci-fi 10 years back. Uh, it's, it's reality today. So we are going to see a lot more uh, artificial intelligence driven analytical techniques coming into enabling sort of, you know, better performance out of technology, hardware, technology and software that we are, where, what we have today. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you've always got to have in the back of your mind, you've got to be one step ahead of the bad people because the pe bad people out there using the technologies in the bad way, aren't they? I think this is the challenge that the security community don't talk about is that I always put a football analogy to it. You know, if you're a center forward, you can miss 50 and have to score just one goal and you're a hero. Mm -hmm. And if you're a, if you're a goalkeeper, you can save 50 shots at, at, at you. You do have to miss only one and you become the villain <laughs> yeah. of the day. Yeah. And, and this is what security industry is. I mean, the security services are protecting us every day. And when an event happens, it's one of those wins by a center forward, and one of those lapses by, by the yeah. goalkeeper. And so it's a constant game of keeping on top of things. And technology is a vital part of it, of making sure security agencies are, are a step ahead of everything that is going on. Because the bad guys are becoming more intelligent. As mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. yeah. so, so in that, I suppose you're just looking forward to just doing what you do, aren't you? Look, we have got a you know, huge opportunity to build a substantial business in the fields that we are. We are inherently a technology company. You know, we have, we are very IP rich, intellectual property rich. We've got over nearly 250 patents and many, many other forms of intellectual property. We are starting to grow and, you know, in a lot of our application areas, the market is starting to mature where technology is starting to be adopted, accepted, implemented. So, yes, we have got a huge growth journey in front of us. Of course, with every growth journey, there are challenges as well. But, yeah. but you know, we are in a good position. All our markets, the fundamental growth drivers are very well aligned to what we do. So I've, I've said many times in the past, I mean, you know, we had a difficult year last year with COVID. But COVID has done a lot of harm. But in our fundamental markets, the growth drivers such as early detection of cancer, protection of cities and infrastructures against uh, terrorism, those are not, those haven't gone away because of COVID. So those, those fundamental needs in the market remain strong. And what we do addresses those needs in a way that the market wants. So, so Chromex, is a you know we are born out of Durham. We we operate globally, but this is our home, and we have a fantastic growth story to uh, look forward to. Yeah, and you've talked to obviously a lot about the company, and uh, I know a little bit about your background now with your your passion for, for drama. But are you the person who really feels like that? The, the one that's pushing things on is this what is this how you feel every day when you get out of bed uh, this is my mission to to push everything along Yvonne you know probably better than I do uh, that this is this is not a job this is your life mm -hmm. and and yeah. uh, if you don't believe in it if you're not passionate about it you can't do it so I can hear your passion <laughs> and so Everybody, I think, in the company believes that what mm -hmm. we are doing is fundamentally going to benefit the world. Yes, it's going to ultimately, you know, we work for our shareholders. We work for creating value for our shareholders. And, but we, we, there is a bigger mission in terms of really providing the world what, which, which, which would benefit mankind. And, and uh, yeah, this, is, this is, again, something that I've said many a times in the past is science is only useful if it actually helps us to lead yeah. better lives and understand what we do. And, and, and this is, you know, we don't do science, we do technology. Science is something that is done in the universities and, and research labs. We convert science into technologies, into useful, useful products and services. Yeah. And, and, and it is, it is uh, you know, it's a great motivator, yeah. what we do. And what about uh, other people and other businesses? Do you, do you look at other people and, and emulate people, try and emulate what they do from the past or, you know, current entrepreneurs? Do you ever look at other people or do you keep your head down and just concentrate on what you do? That you've got pl plenty going on. In, in the pre-COVID world, I used, to, I used to be traveling, I don't know, 60% of my time. You know, throughout this journey, I became the founding CEO of Chromec 
with very little experience of running a business. And so over the years, I've had many, many people who have inspired me and, and, and actually, you know, guided me. And, and, and it, it still happens today. So I learn every day. And, and that's very important. So starting from Professor Max Robinson, who was the founder of this company, and many, many people like, you know, in the region, the city, among our customer base. And I learned from my team, because one thing I, I am a firm believer is you bring in the best people you can afford. And in, in majority, in, in most cases, in, in all cases, actually, people are better at doing their job than I am in, in that area. And, and so every day I learn. And it's not that I follow one particular entrepreneur. It's really about making sure when you, when you talk to somebody, even if it's, you know, somebody reasonably junior in your team, you, you are actually taking in what they have to contribute and what they have to say. And similarly, what's going on in the world some of the visionary people, what they have done in, in the world of technology. You learn from everything, really. And, and I've been blessed to be part of organizations and other boards where I've, I've sat alongside a lot of talented people. You know, I'm, I'm on part of uh, on the Council of Innovate UK currently. I chair the Academic Health Science Network in the region. And some of the people that are on the board are enormously more experienced than me and, and have got different experiences than me. And, and so, you know, I feel every day is a day where you learn new things and, and that's how you develop. So it sounds like that's partly your advice for other people. And tip of the week would be to keep your ears open. Keep your ears open, but follow your instincts. Mm, yeah, uh, because uh, throughout this journey, the number of times I've, I've heard this can't be done. Uh, <laughs> I, if, if, I, if I put a penny every time that I heard that this cannot be done, uh, mm. <laughs> uh, be rich, I'd, very I'd, rich. Be, I'd be really, really <laughs> well off. So uh, it's, it's about learn, but follow your instincts and be resilient. Great place to stop there. That's marvellous stuff there, uh, Arnab. Thank you very much for that. Um, enjoyed, enjoyed learning. I've enjoyed learning about that because I was concerned that I, I wouldn't, um, well, I told you, didn't I, that I, I might feel a bit overwhelmed by your, um, uh, your knowledge. But um, now that I know you play the mandolin as well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yvonne.